Hey guys, this is uh, Jesse Lopez with his 15-minute podcast, the only podcast worth listening, listening to, uh, with my guest here, Terry Latouf. Am I pronouncing that right, sir? Yes, sir. So, how are you doing today? I am good. You know what, uh, this uh, this man here uh, operates the Skylark Lounge, which is one of my favorite places to be in the world. Uh, how long has this uh, open mic been going on? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Oh, that's awesome. With Abe Dashner owning and running this thing, it has been fantastic. He does a great job. That's great. He really does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One of the, the, the questions I, uh, I wanted to ask is, uh, that story about the strip club, what? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> what happened there? We were in high school, and we wanted to go to a strip club. There was one here called Little Abner's. It was a dive. It was the worst, nastiest, falling apart place in the world. But it was the only place we could get into. We had to pay 20 bucks a piece to get in there. And... 20 bucks back back in back in the day that was like 50 today and that I mean beer was only 40 cents so <laughs> it was uh it was it was uh, Kyle who was the leader of our group at that time uh this guy was 6'3 325 I mean just a huge guy and his one of his best friends was a guy named Lonnie who is this backwoods guy from the from the backwoods of Bastrop <laughs> and uh, to tell you how bad that was, uh, we went over, to, we were hunting out there one day and we went over to his house and his mom asked us to stay for dinner. And I said, oh, what do you have? And Kyle just nearly knocked me over because we were, he wanted to get out of there. And I found out why she was making green grape pie and peanut meat. <laughs> to this day, I still don't know what peanut meat is. So anyway, we decided it's Lonnie's birthday. So we're taking him over to a strip club. And... So we pay our 20 bucks, we get in, and of course we're right on Animal Row, right on the front. And there were five of us. And Lonnie is, uh, Lonnie is down at the end, and we're feeding him dollars, and this, this, this gotta be the ugliest woman God ever wanted to gut through, was sitting there. $20 and you get the ugliest one. You get the ugliest one, yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we are sitting there, and uh, we're just, we're watching, and uh, we're feeding Lonnie dollars and he's just I mean he is just laughing it up he's got his face right there and so uh, I turn over to Kyle and I was sitting there talking to him for a second and we look back and Lonnie is like straight up in his chair and just shaking his head and Kyle just breaks out laughing and I said what happened and he goes he farted in his face I said what he goes he farted in his face I said what <laughs> he said she farted in his face and he fell out of his chair I am laughing so hard. This girl turns around. She is beat red. She is going, oh, my God, I am so sorry. That has never happened before. I'll give you a free dance. Lonnie's like, no, 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 no. I don't want no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Kyle, is. we're trying to get Kyle up. There's three of us trying to pick this fat motherfucker up off the floor, and he's laughing so hard he's now totally limp. It is like just like boning a marlin. He is not moving. And we're sitting there trying to pick him up. All of a sudden, the bouncer comes running over. And he goes, what the hell is going on here? And he's looking down at Kyle. Kyle goes, he farted in his face. He said, what? She said, she farted in his face. And he looks over and this girl's still apologizing to poor Lonnie. And he cracks up. He loses it. And none of us can now get Kyle up off the goddamn floor. <laughs> we are. <laughs> the bouncer goes, y'all got to get out of here. <laughs> and so we're sitting there saying, we got to get this guy up. I mean, it took five of us to get him up off the floor, and he was still laughing on the way out. And Lonnie has never been to another strip club as <laughs> to this day. He refuses to go to any strip club. <laughs> she let him have it. <laughs> uh, 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 you and Lonnie actually owned a bunch of uh, machine guns, right? Uh, yes. We had a we uh, we had a 500 acre lease out on the other side of Bastrop, but this side of McDade County, and we had three rules out there uh, for the lease was that we couldn't shoot any ducks, we couldn't shoot any cows, and we couldn't leave any trash. So after spending the weekend out there hunting, we loaded up our trailer full of beer cans, beer bottles, food, 
everything. We had a cabin uh, that we had actually built out of the trees out there. And uh, we had, uh, I had six weapons that we, we probably, between the five of us, we probably had close to 40 guns. And we were on our way back and we stopped off at the county dump. And so we're unloading the trailer and trying to get it all off of there. And uh, it's, uh, the trailer's connected to the back of uh, Kyle's, uh, he's got a convertible uh, that he can take the top off of a, of a Bronco. And so he's just sitting there at the end of the trailer, sitting on the back of the tailgate with a uh, with uh, just sitting there eating a Twinkie, and we're sitting here unloading. And so he he throws this Twinkie, and all of a sudden these just these seagulls come out of nowhere and descend on it. Well, all our heads snap up. We look back at Kyle, and he goes, "Oh yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> on." <laughs> so he reaches back behind him and he grabs an AK-47 and he just starts blasting. I mean, th these birds, they didn't die. These things exploded. So. <laughs> I grab a, uh, I've got a uh, Thompson 45 that shoots 45 as fast as you pull the trigger. A Tommy gun. A Tommy gun. And I started shooting. And then uh, I took out a uh, 1044 uh, auto mag, which is a 44 automatic that shoots 45, 44 as fast as you pull the trigger. They were just disintegrating. And we're sitting there shooting about 15 minutes in. The, everybody that worked there scattered. <laughs> so, her. <laughs> We're sitting there we're just i mean there's brass everywhere we are just i mean and this this there's just this this cloud of cordite just this blue smoke hanging over us and we turn around and here comes a little uh sheriff uh, uh travis county sheriff doesn't even have his gun drawn he just has it on the, the his hand on the butt of his gun we start cracking up i mean we have enough firepower there to hold off just about anything and this guy comes up without his gun drawn well, that lasted about 30 seconds when four DPS cars show up and those guys pile out behind their doors and they have their guns pointed right at us. Yeah, that meant, they said, meant business. Oh, yeah. we were. Uh, <laughs> so we dropped them and uh, they came up and there was one guy there, it was a white cop, just came up and just started screaming and yelling and calling us seven kinds of motherfucker. I only know six. <laughs> and, <laughs> He was, then there was this, uh, this, this huge black cop. This guy was like six, 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 seven. He weighed about 350 and he dwarfed Kyle. And, uh, I mean, Kyle, he was just, he was standing over him and, uh, we were sitting there and he goes, what were you boys thinking? I said, well, we were here and <laughs> they were here and they just kind of showed up out of nowhere when he threw some food and we started throwing all kinds of food out there. And he said, well, not only are you on county property, but seagulls are protected. We didn't know that. <laughs> we knew we were on county property, but we did not know they were protected. So they end up taking us all in. Kyle's dad gets us an attorney. He shows up. He comes in. All five of us are sitting in there. He said, they're going to drop all the charges against you, and you're going to be able to go home tonight. That's, that's nice but they want the guns <laughs> and we're like oh god no because and i had a uh, stainless steel m1 garand made by ruger thing was a thousand bucks by itself so i said all right you know what i want to go home <laughs> kyle's like no i'm taking my guns <laughs> said, you know what you're going to be alone here i'm no uh-uh and so even the attorney told him you well, <sighs> all right your dad said you'd probably take that position <laughs> He said, um, if, uh, if you decide to keep your guns and stay here, then uh, you'll be walking. <laughs> He's taking your car away. He just bought him a brand new Trans Am. So they got the guns. Uh, and, and, and they said they were going to destroy them. We knew better than that. I mean, with what we had, Kyle had an AK-47. I had a 357 Ruger uh, plus my 45 plus a 1022 plus a 1044 uh, plus my M1 Garand. And uh, Kyle had an AK-47. He had a nine millimeter. Oh, beautiful nine millimeter. And uh, three other guns. We I, I had a Winchester. Uh, and it was just uh, we ended up giving them up to him. So <laughs> I ended up uh, asking the attorney to get to have the uh, the cops who got my weapons to contact me. He said, "Well, they're going to destroy them." I said, "No, they're not. Just tell them to yeah. call me." <laughs> I said, "I know better." So the next day I get, a, I get a call from two cops, two different cops, told them to come by and I ended up giving them the cases. I gave them all my extra clips. I gave them all of my ammo. Uh, gave them all the accessories for every gun they got. And they didn't look like they were gonna destroy any of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
they were too grateful <laughs> to think that they were going to be doing that. So we lost our guns, but we gained our freedom. <laughs> Is that the first time you were in trouble with guns? Uh, actually, that was the... Was that the first time? I'm trying to think if that was. Um, think? I mean, I, I would think that you uh, uh, trouble with guns, you'd, you'd remember. <laughs> well, yeah, no, no, no. But I mean, no, we've been approached so many times uh, shooting under bridges. <laughs> and then we put them away before they got there. We had a spotter on that one. And we put him in there. Highly organized. Yeah. <laughs> Shenanigans. Uh, we were under a bridge shooting, and uh, the two cops showed up, and they said, "Are you? We got, we got, we got a report of somebody firing weapons." Well, it wasn't us. We're just down here. <laughs> and uh, luckily, we had a big-breasted girl who wasn't wearing a bra, and we were down in the water, so they, <laughs> uh, she kind of drew their attention away. And they looked at our weapons, and they said, "Well, these are awful oily. Well, we just oiled our guns. We're on our way home. We ride at the cabin." And so they couldn't prove that we were shooting. Especially since we picked up all the brass and buried that, but um, <laughs> that was uh, that was one of our more close calls. Uh, so yeah, we were usually pretty careful not to do anything. Oh, other than the fact, well, we didn't get any trouble, but we used to take our guns out and we would uh, we make a little extra money on the weekends with them. Extra, uh, okay, hold on. Extra money? Like holding a bank? What? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, we would, it would, it would, there'd be the occasional cow that would be on the wrong side of the fence. Oh. And so we would just take a forty-five, pop it in the head. We'd fill strip it right there, and we'd sell the meat to a barbecue place that we knew back in the early 80s. And they'd give us 200 bucks per side, so that was $400 for the weekend. That was our, that was our, that was our money to go out and buy ammo and gas and be able to go out to the cabin for the weekend. <laughs> and kill more cows. Yeah, and kill more cows. Yeah. <laughs> you never yeah. got in trouble for that, uh, killing the, the cows? That no, we, we, we couldn't. We were really desperate one time because we were low on money. We were low on ammo. We were low on gas. And so we uh, we actually uh, went into a uh, went into a field where there was a cow. We were right in the middle of field stripping it when a, uh, when a farmer showed up. He was about probably about 150 yards from us. And so uh, we're out there field stripping, and he, he started screaming. And uh, all of a sudden, he shoots. He's got a, uh, I think it was a 12, it sounded like a 12 gauge shotgun. All of us hit the deck except for Kyle, who was sitting on the back of the truck. And he said, What the hell are you doing? He said, That's a shotgun. We are 100 yards away. What are you doing? He said, And we don't know what else he has. So he said, Well, let's find out. He, he he's, he's sitting there with an AK-47 uh, on his hip, and he just lowers it down to about a 45 degree angle and pops off about six shots. It has a muzzle suppressor on the end, so it's got a six foot flame that shoots out of that thing. <laughs> and he just went whop 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 whop. Well, <laughs> next thing we know, that farmer didn't have anything but a shotgun because <laughs> he was getting back in his truck, and he was. I, that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody lay a scratch in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was peeling rubber in the dirt, and he was gone, and we left shortly after that. <laughs> With the cow. Though. With the cow, yeah. We packed it on ice and took off, yeah. We sure did. Uh, yep. uh, this, yes, this is the 15-minute podcast with uh, Jesse Lopez, my guest here, Terry, uh, connoisseur of big guns and fast cars. Uh, <laughs> What was your favorite car? My favorite car was my Javelin AMX. Javelin. Javelin. Did 160 miles an hour. And when my daughter was about to be born, my wife told me I could not be driving around 160 miles an hour with my daughter in the car. So I ended up having to sell it. And I said, well, I'm going to take one last ride. So I get it cleaned up. I put a for sale sign on it. And I head out Highway 71 between Austin and Lano, and I open it up. And I get up to about 160, about. and I look in my rearview mirror, and somewhere way, way back there, I see these lights. <laughs> I said, "Well, what do I do? Do I keep going or do I stop?" Well, I decided to stop, so because I didn't know what was going to be up ahead of me if he called ahead. Oh. So I went on and pulled over, waited for him to catch up, and when he did, he came up and I rolled down my window, and he said, uh, "So where's the fire?" <laughs> I said, what? He said, where's the fire? Why are you doing 160 miles? He said, well, you asked me how fast I was going. I said, yeah, my speedometer's right. It's 160 miles an hour. He goes, well, where's the fire? 
I said, well, there's no fire. I said, told him the story that I have to sell my car and get a minivan and uh, that uh, this would be my last ride in it. And so he asked for my license and my registration. We didn't have to have insurance back then. So he goes back and he comes back up <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, I'm about to get a ticket to, to, uh, that will probably take me the rest of my life <laughs> to pay off. And so he's sitting there writing on his book and uh, he said, how much are you asking for it? I said, 2000 I needed 1500 for the down payment on my car, and that put me $500 in the bank, which back then was good money. So he said, and he said, are you listening to me? I said, yes, sir. He said, you are not under any circumstances whatsoever. Are you listening? I said, yes, sir. He said, you are not under any circumstances whatsoever to drive my car over 55 miles an hour between here and your house. My car. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, your car? <laughs> I said, and uh, and I, this was before the day of uh, them being able to uh, just confiscate your shit. <laughs> you know, they couldn't just, they couldn't seize it. And so I said, your car? And he rips that off, rips off what I thought was a ticket, hands it to me, and it's a check for 500 bucks. He said, that's a down payment. I'll be there tomorrow to pick up the rest of the, to pick up the car and I'll bring you the rest of the cash. So I took it real easy all the way home because if I put a scratch on it now, he's going to know it. So I eased it on home. Sure as his word, 10 a.m. the next morning, he came, brought me a check for 1500 bucks, and I had to watch that son of a bitch walk, drive off with my car. <laughs> so one, uh, uh, so a cop has your car and a few other and had your my guns. guns. Yeah, yeah. What, I am. What else? Uh, yeah. What else? Yeah, they love me. Yeah. Well, I, I just keep thinking they're going to show up to my house like it's some kind of a fucking Walmart and say, "What else does he have that we want?" Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> the first words out of my mouth is going to be, "Take my wife, please." Please. <laughs> uh, you. You've done a lot of uh, 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 work in comedy. Actually, uh, you, you're like one of the most successful comics in, in Austin. But well, no, there was a lot more. There were a few more that were more successful. But um, I came up five years from '80 80 to '85 with, um, and I, I performed. Came up through the ranks with uh, Bill Ingvall, Bill Hicks, Carry On, um, and uh, just running the circuit the same way that it is now. I don't think I could survive the way it is now. There's so many comics yeah, out here Yeah, a lot now. of competition. And there's so many venues. We only had three. And one of them was part-time. I mean, it wasn't even a full venue. So the Austin, uh, the comedy workshop was pretty much it. That was, that back in the day, that was the only place that you could really perform. And so um, there, there was just, I mean, we were talking just a ton of comics that would show up for a small venue like that. We're talking, you know, like here, we got 35, 40 comics to show up at Skylark. There were, you know, 40, 50 that would show up at, uh, at the uh, comedy workshop and they only had open mic one night a week on Tuesday. Just one night, yeah. Just one night a week, that's it. That's all you had. So uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't as bad as it is now as far as being cutthroat, but uh, there was always everybody vying for a position. Uh, to uh, to try to get in and and be able to be heard, so um, yeah, it was, but it was a lot of fun, and it is uh, doing stand up comedy is just a just a, a, a there's no better job you could ever have than doing stand up comedy ever. That is the greatest thing you can do is to make people laugh. Yeah, <laughs> so. I try. Uh, usually, yeah. usually yeah. I just make myself laugh. Out there, I usually have to pull down my pants. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that, that is a laugh and a half, depend on, depending on where you're facing or what exactly, direction you're yeah. facing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you did a lot of writing uh, yep, for, uh, uh, what is it, commercials? Uh, yep, I started out, I was, uh, I, was doing, I was writing about six hours a day, every day, seven yeah, days a week. Man, that's, um, a lot. that's a lot of, of time. A lot of time I mean, writing, and I would hear other comics' voices in my head as I was putting, the, as I was writing my stuff. I would hear their voices when when, when I was doing the material, when I was re reading it, and I said, "Nope, that's not mine. That belongs to them." So I started actually putting together routines for other comics, making them about fifteen minutes, five to fifteen minute routines, and then I would sell it to them, and. Uh, uh, you know, anywhere from a 15-minute routine for 50 bucks all the way down to five minutes for 10 bucks. 
So, I mean, it was, you know, that was not bad money back then, but I was making a lot more money writing than I was performing. Uh-huh. And uh, I wrote for one guy, uh, his name was uh, Charles, and uh, his name was uh, Chuck Roast. That's his stage name. And I wrote so much material for him that he couldn't afford to pay me. So when he wanted to um, uh, join, run into the uh, Funniest Man in Austin contest, he wanted me to write some routine for him. And I told him not until he paid me. And he said, just this one time, come on, and I'll pay you. And I said, nope. I said, but I'll tell you what I will do. I will give you a 15-minute routine. But I'm taking your name. You can't ever use it again after the after this last Funny Man in Austin contest. So the Funny Man in Austin contest came up on t- on on Tuesday. He didn't win, but he did come in third. And so um, I took his name. So I've been using it since 1983. All right. So, <laughs> so, so, you, so I'm, you've been I'm, I'm been Chuck Roast yeah. since so, 1983. So you, you've yeah. been getting arrested under Chuck under Roast. Chuck Roast. <laughs> <laughs> for 20 <Yeah>. years. <laughs> So then yeah. I would be riding around, I'd be driving, and I would hear the most stupidest, the most insane, the worst commercials coming out of local places well, here. Well, you hear that and today, actually. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> no, it's sick. So uh, I wrote, I would write commercials. I would just write the commercial, take it to them, and say, here, put this on the air. It's a hell of a lot better than, uh, than what you got on there. Yeah. <laughs> And I said, if you like it, pay me for it. If you don't, don't. I don't care if you pay me or not. Just don't make me listen to y'all's commercials anymore. Yeah, that's a, that, and so, that is, a, that is a, a, a comedian that you're doing it for the love of, of the writing and the, the, yeah. the, the laughter. And it turned out that they did like it and they paid me for it and they wanted more. So that kind of segued into me writing, uh, writing um, uh, radio commercials. And I was doing, you know, 15, 20 of those every week 30 of those a week and then a week? from there it would it would week. go in a every, week every week every week i was doing I, radio commercials yeah I don't, I don't even know people that write 15 minutes a week <laughs> <laughs> so, um so uh and the tough part on those is that you got to get it down to where it's exactly 30 seconds exactly wow. it has to be exactly i'm sorry no on uh, on radio it's one minute on t- and then i started writing tv commercials and those were tough because those are exactly 30 seconds. So you can only do 30 second commercials. So I was doing, I was writing um, uh, TV commercials for some of the same companies. And I did that for a few years. Yeah. Oh, and no. then when my daughter started getting older, it was time for me to go and get a real job. So <laughs> I went, got, I Never went back really. into management and that's where I've been ever since. So that's what I've been doing. So Chuck Roast went into management then. Chuck Roast went into retail management, that's right. Any uh, anyone famous you wrote for, or uh, any jokes yep. that you sold? Uh, to? I sold. Uh, I've got material that is uh, that has sold to uh, to Rodney Dangerfield. Well, one of my favorites. Uh, I think he might be just my favorite. Yeah, uh, I love Rodney Dangerfield, uh, and I just uh, I, that actually happened because I was writing for a comic who uh, did about a hundred and ten voices, and he did the best Rodney Dangerfield impression I'd ever heard. And so uh, I wrote that, and it, the, the, uh, one of the owners of the comedy workshop actually contacted uh, Rodney Dangerfield's agent and said, hey, we got some material here for you, and it sold for 50 bucks a line. Can you so, remember uh, some of those lines? Yeah, one of them was, um, my daughter flunked her driving test. She didn't know what to do in the front seat. <laughs> And oh my gosh, that was 35 years ago, 30 years ago. Let me see. That's about the. That's the one that sticks in my mind, just because that was one of my favorites. Because um, I wrote so many of them for him, uh, for uh, for him to do Dangerfield with. I probably wrote 200 lines for him just on Dangerfield alone. And then he did Columbo. Uh, wrote for him Charles Bronson, John Wayne, um, Clint Eastwood. The, uh, these the are the voices, voices that he did voices. yeah so I was just writing so many of them and just sitting down and that, that when, you, when you just when you do so many and like I said Dangerfield is the one that I wrote the most on just because I love hearing it so it's great. It's, uh, are your jokes for sale can any of these people uh, buy your jokes at uh, Terry's joke shop or <laughs> something I thought about writing something. I, I had I, I you know you have no idea how many times I started to write a uh, that I actually started writing a joke book and I mean just because um, just probably well over a thousand no well over a thousand jokes I yeah. mean you, you I, I know you've helped me a lot with uh, with my comedy uh, 
so I, I thought about writing some, uh, some a joke book and I've started so many times and then um, by the time the ones that I'm trying to remember in the middle of trying to remember the ones that I know I'm sitting here writing new ones because another word or a phrase or something will pop up and um, I don't know if you do you, if you remember the Dick Van Dyke show yeah uh, and Buddy Sorrell the human joke machine that's who I patterned my comedy after is him being able to come up with a joke using any word or phrase that someone gives me so oh wait so I, <laughs> I I could live to be like 150 and I don't think I could have a, a life as exciting as, as yours <laughs> that's productive nothing <laughs> like I could live three lifetimes I would never <laughs> Not even one of those stories. Ah, uh, oh, man, that's that's amazing. I, uh... So yeah, it's been, but that it, it has been fun. Comedy was just a lot of fun. Being in the clubs, uh, being on the road, just meeting all kinds of and other comics out there that you meet are just unbelievable. They're just you know they're just great guys, yeah. and they're all there for the same reason, just to make people laugh. Yeah. They yeah. can say I want to be famous. They can say I want to be discovered. They can say I want money. They can say I want fame and fortune. But it all comes down to the, the, the common denominator here is that they just like making people laugh. They love hearing yeah, that. That's, that's, that is the addictive part of this is just listening to people yeah, laugh that, that's why I'm and doing knowing this. you're the cause of it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I just want to make people laugh. That's, that's my thing. And that stage is so addictive. It's hard to walk away from it. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I, I consider myself a little bit of a writer, but I don't have anyone to write for. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't be like, oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, I wrote a joke for you. Yeah, this uh, woman in a wheelchair. <laughs> they're, yeah. like, they're like, yeah, no, no. That's I have an true. abortion joke. No, uh, no. I, I don't think anybody can. Can, uh, can do your in, comedy. No, uh, your, your, in, your own uh, brand of comedy. Austin. No, you. Yeah, in Austin. Really, yeah, I'm yeah. afraid you're just, I mean, other people can write for you, but I don't think you could write for anybody else unless you yeah, can find another just, Jesse Lopez out there. Yeah, I, I hope there's not <laughs> one out there. I think it's enough. Yeah, if there was, he probably offed himself. There was, uh, but he was uh, he was a lot angrier than you were, and he's dead now, and that would be Sam Kennison. So, <laughs> <laughs> but he was a lot more angry than you were. Yeah, he had, he had a reason. He was a preacher. It's, uh, well, so. oh, uh, any any big shows that you you got to do? Anyone uh, that you got to perform with? Yeah, or? I I uh, I was actually able to open for Bill Ingvall a few times. Uh, and um, that was very, very. That was a lot of fun. That was, yeah, that yeah. was very. Uh, good. What do you call it? Poor man's uh, uh, Jeff Foxworthy. Yes. <laughs> or Jeff Foxworthy light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but uh, I don't know. Maybe you should come up with something like that. You know, here's your sign. Uh, <laughs> something that that just kind of uh, that just kind of kicks out there to uh, to let people know you're there. I should. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm gonna start writing jingles. Uh, that would work. Like, uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna try that. Let's, you could do that. Yeah, you could. That would. Uh, they're, they're gonna reject them. They're gonna be like, like what? I don't, I don't know if I'd buy anything. <laughs> yeah. You got a jingle too, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just write it off the list of abortions, rape. <laughs> yeah. <It's like> quite, <laughs> we're, we're we're trying to sell cars. Why are you hating on Mexicans, Jesse? This is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they wouldn't say that. They would just be like, get out. Get out. <laughs> like, no, but I have another one. Get out. <laughs> that would be my, re yeah, that would be their reaction to my, to my jingles. <laughs> Take your, oh, yeah. Yeah. I could hear it now. Take your for little your piano, next, yeah. <laughs> Take your for little your next piano abortion, you. use Harry's hangers. <laughs> 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 yeah. High quality hangers. Yeah. They were triplets. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Terry. This this has been uh, great. I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna have to record you some other time. I'm gonna get you nice and drunk, and all the all the awful stuff is gonna come out next time. <laughs> this is just the I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, there's been a lot. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah that's been, hear... uh, that's that's pretty much the highlights. I mean, the highlights. The highlights. I don't yeah. believe it. I don't believe it. We're gonna have to. <laughs> get you back on uh, well I've enjoyed being here oh yeah great uh, do you want to uh, promote yourself on the Instagrams or Twitters or something oh no no no, no, no. <laughs> yeah no 
You heard it here. Uh, Chuck, uh, yeah, Chuck Roast. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look up Chuck Roast on um, uh, Twitter or something. Uh, for me, comedy has become more than a, more of a uh, spectator sport now than a participation sport. So uh, just enough to keep my hand in, and I will make the. I will make the folks around me laugh, and that's good enough with me. That's good. Well, before we leave, uh, you, you have a just a catalog of, of, of uh, one-liners. Uh, can you just uh, share with us just a few, just off the top oh, of your head? Oh, let's see. Uh, Baby Seal walks into a club. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, let's see. One-liners, one-liners would be... Uh, what we, in fact, we were just talking about that before we went on. Yeah, you, uh, you, you, yeah, you had like eight yeah, of them right in, in yep, a row. Uh, yeah, and I can't remember a single one. Right? <laughs> well, uh, we're gonna, yeah, we're, uh, the best way to put a comic on the spot is to, is to look at him and say, "Say something funny." Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, and a lot of times they're like, "Well, say something funny." It's like, I'm not a clown. You want me to start juggling? I, I don't understand what they want. I just I, I need one-liners because I, that, that's I just look at them and say no. No. <laughs> that's, that's like the masochist walking up to the sadist and saying, slap me. The sadist says, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I, well, if, you, uh, when, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if we record something, I promise you I'll have some one-liners for you. All right, sounds good, man. Thank you very much for being at the, in the Jesse Lopez 15-minute podcast. My pleasure.